at 7 p.m. in our choir room, we will be having our Good Grief support group. Many have experienced the loss of a loved one, and we want to be here to help in the healing process and experience Good Grief together. This will be a dessert fellowship, so please consider bringing a dessert to share. We'd love to see you there. Please invite someone to come along. We don't want anyone to be grieving alone. 
we are launching a brand new ministry next Sunday called The Gathering. This will be a quarterly potluck held right here at the church. Immediately following service, we will meet in the gym for a time of food, fun, games, and fellowship. The church will be providing the main entree. Everyone is encouraged to bring a dish to share, whether it be a side dish or a dessert, the choice is up to you. An email was sent out last week with details on all you'll need to know for the event. Not sure if we have your email, you can be added to our database by texting the word GATEWAY to 22383. If you are new to Gateway or you've been coming for quite some time and are now considering becoming a member, we'd like to invite you to our newcomers breakfast on Sunday, September 4th at 9 a.m. An email was sent out with a link to sign up for the breakfast. It is important that you RSVP so that we can make preparations for that morning. If you'd like to receive texts and emails from the church, please text the word GATEWAY to 22383 and provide us with your contact information using the link that will be sent to you. A new session of our discipleship class called Foundations of the Faith will be starting on Sunday, September 4th at 9 a.m. This will be a six-week class that will help you strengthen your faith. An email was sent out with a link to sign up. Please be sure to let us know of any child care needs so we can make preparations for that. Whether you are new to our church or you have been here for a while, this will help you obtain and maintain a strong foundation. Join us on Wednesdays for Family Life Night. Classes are available for all ages. If you are unable to join us in person, the adult devotional will be live streamed and will be available on YouTube and Facebook at 7 p.m. Thanks for watching! Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Are we all awake today? Hallelujah. Is he good or not good? He is good, amen? His mercy endures forever and ever and ever. I don't know how you feel this morning, but we're going to have a good time in service, amen? Because the king is in the house. So if you're by someone, you might want to leave a little bit of room because this song, you're going to get a little crazy, all right? Just make yourself feel welcome.
Amen. You love God in here tonight? Am I loud enough? It feels weird. Maybe I'm not getting monitored or something. I love that song. That was powerful. You know, I was thinking about something. Like you deserve. And you know, I never want to judge another man's worship. Because that's our worship to God. And you know, there's a scripture in the Bible. It's in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. And one of the translations says this. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You know, last week we had a bunch of young people in here. And the Bible says that young people inspire us in zeal. And it's important for us, the older folks, to make sure we help them with wisdom. Amen? And that's the balance. I, I pray that we are a zealous church when it comes to worship. I pray there's a passion. Now listen, I'm not judging you. If you're a stoic person, maybe that's who you are. However, let me say this. If your team wins the Super Bowl and you go, ah, and you come in here and do this, you lying to yourself. If you get that deal, like you, you go in and bid auctions on, on the internet and all of a sudden you get something for a breakneck deal and you're so excited and you run around the house telling everybody and you come in here and during worship, you sleeping, you're lying to yourself. So I'm just saying, let's keep our spiritual zeal and fervor and let's worship God like he deserves. Amen. Come on now. I want to serve him like he's the most important thing in my life. And that's a good way to kind of get a barometer. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in God's house. Boy, I tell you what, I'm tired. I was at the overnighter most of the night. I ain't gonna lie to you. I'm usually I'm there all the time, but I'm getting old. I, I, I cut out about an hour early. And uh, then I had to pick my daughter up at the airport and get home 2.40. My, my, my flesh, it's weak, but my spirit's willing because I serve a big, 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 big God. And it's just good to be in here serving him and worshiping him. And we are a blessed church. And to have our young people going after God, I tell you what, church, we got so much to be excited about and go after God about. Amen? Are you glad to be in this house today? I believe it's going to be a great day and God's just going to show up in a special way and we want to allow him to do that. Right now as you're giving, by the way, and I know many of you give on your app and behind me should be a QR code and you can just put your phone up. It'll take you right to where you need to give. Now, if you are texting to give, whether you're watching online or you're here right now, you want to text what? 22383. Yes, exactly. Quentin's my assistant when it comes to this. You text the word invest, invest to 22383 and you can give and obviously there's buckets down here to give and we appreciate the faithfulness of this house that allows ministry to go forward now we do say this if you're a first time guest we're asking you not to give I know that sounds strange to you but honestly we just want to be a blessing to you and love you now if that's what you're accustomed to doing uh, we're not going to push you away from but we just want you to know that is definitely not expected of you we just want to love you and let you know how much we love you can we tell them how much we love them here at Gateway Amen. Anyway, good to be in God's house. Let's just uh, go to him right now in prayer and offer this day up to him. Father, we come before you and we are blessed. We are so blessed that you sent your son to die for us. We are so blessed that God, you give us blessings every day. Lord, thank you for your love, your attentiveness. Uh, I'm reminded of the word that says, who am I, God, that you are mindful of me? Who are we, God, that we're, you're mindful of us, but yet you're crazy about us, yet your passion is toward us, God. And Lord, today in our worship, God, I know that we can just sing it out of our mouth and it's just words, but God, when our spirit cries out, when our spirit cries out in a zealousness and says, God, you are God and there's none like you, God. Lord, you are so excited. You said you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord God, may you just show up here today, God. Meet every need, God. But more than anything, draw us closer to you, God. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we give you all the glory in this house. May we never lose our zeal and our spiritual fervor, God, in chasing after you. In Jesus' name, come on, give God glory. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade, they're never enough. But then you came along, yes, you did. Put me back together. 
never get tired of telling you you're worthy. There's so many ways I could sing of your glory. Though my body may be tired, my soul will never get tired of telling you holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Come on right now, just lift up, lift up your praise to him. No matter how tired we are this morning, no matter what happened this week, our souls could never grow tired of telling him, worthy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. Holy are you, Lord. Come on, come on, press in. Don't just worship when we have the kids up here. He's worthy of our worship every single week. Come on, what would it look like? Musically, sound wise, you were created to praise. You are the instrument. So if everything cuts out up here, you lift up your voice because he's worthy. And it doesn't matter what you came here today with or what you're dealing with, the blood is still 
the blood. It cleanses, it washes, it sets free, it delivers. So whatever it is you came in the house with today, the blood is still the blood and it washes away all your sins. Worship, sustain this attitude of worship with us. See, I was a leper outside the city. None would come close, but you wouldn't let go. See, what work back then? <laughs> It'll work again, because I know the blood is still the blood. I had an issue no one could help. See, I've tried them all. My last cry, I crawled. What worked back then will work again. Cause I know the blood is still the blood. Oh, how precious, how beautiful This priceless love I've come to know And in the midst of my darkest storm
God. I got so lost and happy I forgot to bring my mic. How many know the blood's still the blood? Now I'm going to stay in this attitude of worship. In fact, we're going to take communion, but we're going to sing another song. So if you want to grab your cup and come back, if you didn't have a chance to get a cup, ushers are right back there for communion. You know, as we were singing this, the blood is still the blood. And I just began to think about things like technology. Man, our cars are so much better. Airplanes are incredible what they can do these days. This little device right here, Alexander Graham Bell, when he invented the telephone, you think he ever thought it would become this? And we have invented because God's given us wisdom and, you know, because the device isn't wrong, it's the application that can be the problem. But God gave us wisdom. And we have improved on so many things. But I'm here to tell you, the blood is still the blood. No improvement could happen to that. You know, Jimmy, as you were singing it, talking about going through my darkest time, I couldn't help but think when you and Chris are going through a health battle and was talking on the phone and praying and Jimmy just falling apart. That's my wife. But the blood was still the blood. And, you know, he got on social media, and he just, you could tell it was out of pain. He just worshiped. See, when you get to know people and watch them go through and say, I'm holding on to Jesus no matter what, that's when you know the blood is still the blood. Amen? Today, we're going to worship the Lord. And a scripture just came to my mind, if I could, right before we take communion. I challenge you today, you know, Jesus, he instituted communion with his disciples. He instituted this supper, and I thought, you know, wow, we're going today to just represent in our communion, our relationship with God. Think what they had to do in the Old Testament. They would had to take a lamb or whatever they were sacrificing, drag it to the temple. I just began this morning to think about the ease of us coming in because Jesus did all the work. Come on now. I think of Brother Bill Stahl, he rides a motorcycle. Can you imagine him dragging that lamb behind him, running to church, like yanking a lamb, a SPCA following him down the road? He didn't have to do that. He just come in here, Jesus did all the work. And right now he's gonna take communion and say, Lord, thank you. You know, there's a, there's a scripture In Revelations, where Jesus was talking to the churches, and he said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody hears my voice, not just hears a sound, but hears his voice, hears it in our spirit and receives it, and when we receive it, we open the door. He said, I'm going to come into him, and I'm going to dine with him. Or if you're reading the King James, sup with him. He said, and he with me. Man, that's what communion is all about. He said, look, I, I'm standing at the door. If you'll just open it up, 
So if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, you haven't come to Jesus, all it is is just saying, Lord, I accept your sacrifice. I accept what you did. I know I can't get there on my own. Turn from my sins. I turn to you. Come on in and be the Lord of my life. My friend, if you pray that from a sincere heart, from a sincere heart with faith, I believe that moment you're saved and then walk out your Christian life. Today, can we honor the Lord by taking this communion? Remember that he paid it all. And today we're going to worship him for who he is, what he's done in our lives. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul had received this from the Lord. He said, I'm passing on to you. He said, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said he took the bread. When he'd given thanks, and Lord, we thank you for this. He broke it and he said, this is my body. He said, which is for you. Do this and remember to me. Can we take the bread? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says in the same way after supper, he took the cup. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, we're going to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, meaning that he paid it all. He did it all. All we had to do was open the door, and he came in. Can we drink together? Can we pray before we sing this song? We're going to sing a song, Jesus paid it all. You didn't do it, I didn't do it. All we did is open the door and let him come in. Lord, we thank you today that you did all the work. Thank you, God, for the relative ease it is to come to you. Lord, it's that surrender we know, and that's the battle. Lord, do we surrender? Will we yield? But Lord, you did all the work. You paid for our sins. You pursued us relentlessly. You set up everything in our life, even the bad things that just came our way because the enemy brought them or because it just rains on the just and the unjust the same. Even those things, God, you worked in them and through them to get us to a place where we can know you. Lord, we stand in this house today and say, Thank you for the blood. Thank you for your body. Thank you the blood still the blood. Thank you that it didn't lose its power. Thank you there's no invention we need to create. Thank you, Lord God, that it's still the blood today. Lord, you did it all. You paid it all, Lord. You, God, are our all in all. And Lord, if we've got you, we've got everything. And if we don't have you, we have nothing. If you be for us, who can be against us? And thank you that you said you'll be with us to the very ends of the earth. Lord, as we worship now and just take a moment and reflect that you paid it all. When the devil comes and said, you're not enough, say, no, no, I'm sorry. But Jesus, he paid it all. When the devil says, you can't get rid of your past, no, 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 I'm sorry. Jesus paid it all. Lord, we thank you today. We worship you, God. And we thank you for what you did and what you're doing in our lives this day. And Lord, thank you for the promise that one day we're going to be around that throne and Lord, doing nothing but worshiping you and knowing you even greater. We love you and we worship you right now. Come on, worship in this song.
Hallelujah. Father, we honor you. I pray that the Lord will clear your minds and your heart. Any stresses and distractions that may be here today, I pray that they'll be silenced and that you will be ready to receive the word of God. Lord, thank you for already being here this morning, the dynamic, spirit-filled worship. We've sang, your word declares that you inhabit the praises of your people. We trust you're here this morning. Yes. God, we sang about the blood still being the blood. Today, Lord, as I give a message, I pray that we'll know maybe more clear than we ever have before that our trust is in you and not in our flesh, not in ourselves. It's in the blood. Get me out of the way. And may you get all the glory. May we leave a little bit more theologically sound. May we leave a little bit more empowered. May we leave better than the way we came. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we the people say amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, feel free to give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. As everyone's finding their seats, I'll just take a quick minute before I start the message and say what an honor it was to minister to our youth on Friday night at our lock-in, our overnighter. There was 70 young people between middle school and high school and it was an awesome night Uh, if y'all were here last week the the youth just blessed us with the worship and they blessed me again Friday night and they stayed up all night long and I even got a few extra kids at my house yesterday that blessed me all Saturday as well and this morning, if you're, if you're a police officer, close your ears for a second. This morning, I was driving seven deep in an Altima. And yeah, you heard it right, seven deep. But that thing was sanctified, Holy Ghost filled. I prayed, Lord. I said, Lord, I'm going to drive seven people in this car today. I said, I know it's not legal. But what I also know is these kids wanted to come to my house. And I'm praying if I get pulled over... You give me the ability to ask the cop to get me out the car so I can tell him a little something, something, one-on-one. And I already had a story in my head. It was true, though. I was going to tell him about, uh, you know, just the kids that were at our house and and, and how awesome they were and on fire they were for God and the struggles of life. And they just had to come over, and I'm just trying to help them out. And can you just let a brother go? We're heading to church. I wasn't going to tell him I was the pastor of Gateway. I was going to tell him I was the pastor of Lifehouse. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? That's what you kind of got to throw that around every once in a while. Pastor Patrick is probably here today of all weeks that I say that. Uh, But all jokes aside, um, I did have a lot of kids at our house, but, you know, they blessed me on Friday night. If your children or grandchildren, nieces and nephews are in middle school and high school and they're not coming to our Wednesday night service, uh, you need to get them there because God's working. Uh, Matter of fact, not only are they building great relationships and they're becoming a wonderful community, uh, we believe that community is so important. I believe that uh, the preached word is powerful. I believe that faith comes by hearing the word of God. I believe that we are transformed uh, when we hear the word preached. We're sanctified through the word and through the Holy Spirit. But can I also tell you that the enemy doesn't want you to get connected to a church. He wants you to sneak in and sneak out and never know people's names. Because if you don't know people's names, you don't build relationships. And if you don't build relationships, you don't build accountability. And we don't build accountability... Uh, you really limit what God has for you. 
And I say that because I'm segueing into next week. We're starting something new. I'm very thankful for Shannon who uh, brought this idea to us. And that is we're going to start doing something four times a year called The Gathering. And it's going to happen after church on Sunday uh, four times a year. And our first one is next week. What the gathering is, is it is a time of fellowship. It's a potluck. We'll have games. There'll be some things that we do. And we're asking you to bring your whole family to the gym after church. And it'll be a themed event every time we have it. The, the church will be providing all of the meats and then we're asking for every family to bring something. But please, millennials, don't just bring millennial dishes, all right? I mean, the potlucks today are different than the potlucks in the 90s. How many are 80s? How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, old school potlucks, you got real food. Potlucks today, you get like Doritos. And nobody want no Doritos. Bring, leave your funky smelling Doritos and Fritos at home. We don't want no processed food. We want you to go to Granny's house and make some fresh baked macaroni and cheese with three layers of cheese. Get some greens cooked cook with some fat back, some hog maw. Bring us something good. We want meat. If you are vegetarian, you can bring that too. We'll eat it. We'll talk about you, but we'll eat it. And let's just have a good time, all right? If you do bring chips, God bless you. We're going to put your name on it and everybody's going to see it. We will put your name. When you come in, first thing we do is label every dish. We put signs up. We don't, we don't say what the dish is called. We put the, who the dish is from. So you're walking past and you're like, oh, look what Bobby brought. Ooh. <laughs> you're like, oh. <laughs> right? So we're going to know. We, we don't care what it is. We want to know who it's from so we can talk about you later. But next week, please come and be a part. It's going to be a great time. We're going to continue to build on it. Hopefully, it's going to be uh, well participated by you, the people. Um, with that being said, we are needing to set up and we are looking for volunteers. Shannon will be located in the lobby immediately following service. Please go see her and see how you can help. I'll tell you right now, we'll be setting up on Saturday at 5 p.m. And then they will be asking for some help on Sunday at 9 a.m. Now, maybe you don't want to help set up or come um, on Sunday morning to be involved, what you do need to do and you cannot avoid is bringing a dish. Please bring something. All jokes aside, I, we get busy. I'll be the first one to tell you, I got four kids at home and there is a very good chance the Lord's going to lead me to Martin's. Sunday morning to the dessert section, and I'm going to buy something. Very, very good chance. I'm going to try not to, but I say that to say we will go down together if you come with something and you get a label for something you purchased, all right? But please bring something. If you've got a hot dish and you want to bring it in a pot, in a um, crock pot, just take it down to the gym before service. You can drop your food off there. There will be people there collecting food, plugging it when it needs to be plugged in. And then immediately after church, we will transition down to eat and play some games. We hope that you come and be a part and begin to get connected. For those of you that already have anxiety because you got to interact with people, you need to come. You all know who I'm talking about, okay? You sit in the back, you come late, and you leave early. You need to be there, all right? Let's go ahead and get in our message today. I, I really wanted to go back to Daniel, but I couldn't go back to Daniel. Um, I'm going somewhere completely different today. And uh, what I want to talk to you today about is something that I'm entitling, Our Loss, Our Win. Our Loss, Our Win. Uh, you know, most of the times when you lose, you lose, but in the kingdom of God, when you lose, you win. Uh, the Bible says that we are all, sorry to say this, losers, a uh, big capital L, and there's no way around it, but thank be to God, we are and become winners because the blood is still the blood. 
And I want to talk to you specifically out of Philippians chapter 3 today. If you've got your Bibles and want to join me again, Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to do some teaching for you here for, for a few minutes and um, hopefully lay a really good groundwork in giving you some theological stuff to go home and chew on yourself. One beautiful thing about our church is we are a diverse ministry. And I love being a diverse ministry because we are a ministry for all people. It doesn't matter where you find yourself on your journey of faith, you are welcome here. We will love you where you are and help you to become all that God has called you to be. With that being said, I never want to take for granted uh, the simple things that God has taught me that aren't really that simple at all. And, and, and I want to revisit things that sometimes we just think everyone knows. Because a lot of times we don't just all know. And, 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 and I want to get us all at the same place, if you will. I, I want to talk specifically about our connection with God and, and how this process works and how we connect with God the Father. And, and I want to look at the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, and he's writing to the church of Philippi, and in chapter 3, he opens up and he says, finally, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious. He says, rejoice in the Lord. We know other places he says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, Rejoice. And now he's writing again and he says, oh, finally, brothers, I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say the same thing that I've already said before again. He says, rejoice in the Lord. He says, man, I know that it seems like I say this all the time. He says, for me to write the same thing to you may seem tedious. He says, but it's not tedious. But for you, it is safe. I'll get back to that in a minute. He says, I need you to beware of dogs. I need you to beware of dogs. I need you to beware of evil workers. I need you to beware of the, of the, what? Mutilation. Beware of the mutilation. For we are of the circumcision. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. And then it says, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in your flesh. You are to have no confidence in your flesh. But I look good. I don't care how good you look. Have no confidence in your flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, he says, yeah, you might be confident in your flesh, but I am even more confident in my flesh. If you thought that you were confident, I am even more confident. Oh, you want to know why? Here, let me tell you why. He says, number one, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Number two, I'm of the stock of Israel. Number three, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of all Hebrews. Concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is of the law, I was blameless. He says, oh, if you want to talk for a moment about someone who had the right to be arrogant, if you want to talk for a moment about someone who had the right to be close to God, it was me. It was me. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke weed. I didn't snort coke. I didn't use any drugs. I didn't shoot needles. I grew up in a good family. Went, grew up in a good home. I learned the law early. I lived by the law. I lived blameless. I worked for the church. I had a doctorate in the ministry. Like, like I, if anyone was right with God without Jesus, it was me. He says, but the things that were a gain to me... I counted a loss for Christ. See, we lose, but we win. See, yet indeed, I count all things a loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And he goes on to say in verse 9, And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and be conformed 
to his death. I know we read this, and this was a lot that we just covered. Many of y'all are he- that are here today, you've been in church a long time. You've, you've studied scripture, and you read this, and you're like, amen, amen, and amen. Others of you have been at church for a long time, but maybe don't study a lot, or church is kind of a new thing to you, or theologically you don't really know. And you, read, you hear me reading this, and you're like, a lot of that just sounds like gibberish. Like that, that, we're getting a little deep now. My goal is to really break this down because it is so important that we understand what the Apostle Paul is saying as he's writing to the church of Philippi. And actually, I've only got three points for you today, but don't get, you know, don't get real happy real quick because they're three long points. All right, so don't think, praise God, three points will be out in 30 minutes because that's not true. That's just not what we do here. Okay, and, and, and uh, we, we, I, I, I got one time a week once a week to help you to be the best that you can be, and I'm going to make the best of it. I know you're only supposed to preach 20 minutes because people in our world's ADD, but you got to suck it up and figure it out, all right? Because, I mean, it's just it, the blood is still the blood, and in my blood, I'm still long-winded, and I just need get, the God's just got a message for you, so you got to deal with me, honey. Three points or eight points, I'm preaching for an hour and a half, whether you like it or not, and I'm just messing with you. <laughs> But Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, look what it says. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. The first point that I want you to see is, is rejoice in the Lord. All right, rejoice in the Lord. If you're a note taker, here's your time to take a note. Here's the time to snap a picture. Rejoice in the Lord. Now we're going to go back to this scripture, and I want you to really see it. Okay, because I want you to understand. I want to break this down a little bit more than we usually do when we think rejoice in the Lord. He says, finally, my brethren, underlined, rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, for me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but it is safe for you. And I begin to think about that. What, what is he saying when he's saying, hey, I know I say this all the time, but I want to say it again. Rejoice in the Lord. And, and here is the thing we've got to get. If you want to really understand what he's saying here, you've got to keep reading the text. Because what he's saying in the text, the point that I'm trying to convey to you today is that we do not connect with God based off our own works. You cannot get close to God because of everything you do right, and you're not further from God and, 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 and ostracized from him because of everything you've done wrong. It, it is all God. The gospel means good news, and the good news is you've done nothing right, but God still welcomes you in. He loves you. And the Apostle Paul, what he's teaching, he says, look, if there's anybody who's got bragging rights, it's me. Is there anybody who can get to heaven on their own? It's me. He says, I grew up as an Israelite. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. The law, I kept it. I was blameless. I have a doctorate in the ministry. I was a righteous dude. I did everything right. I was a good guy, grew up in a good family, 18th generation Pharisee. Pharisee, if anyone deserved heaven without Jesus, it was me. See, that's the point. The point is, he wants us to understand that it's all God. Everybody say it's all God. It's not us. There is nothing that you can do. You can pray all you want. You can cover yourself up all you want. You can stop drinking. You can stop smoking. You can do all the good things, good, all the bad things you get out of your life. And you can do everything right. But the problem is we are still wicked. We're still evil. We're still jacked up. And we need God to renew us. We need God, only God can restore us and reconcile us to himself. The blood is still the blood. He is the way that we are redeemed. And so the Apostle Paul is about to teach this theological lesson. And the lesson that he's teaching us is by grace you've been saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. It's a free gift of God. 
He's teaching us that you can't do anything to gain salvation. You can't do anything to get to heaven. You can do all the good works you want, but your faith is cor- your, your flesh is corrupt and you need God. So he opens up and he says, rejoice in the Lord. What he was really saying is do not rejoice in yourself. Don't rejoice in yourself. Oh, you know what? I feel so good about myself. I've not drank in four weeks, and I've not smoked and ate, and I stopped doing this, and I quit doing this, and I've been going to church for a month and a half, and I've been coming early, and I've been faithful, and I've been doing all these things. That long list will not get you to heaven, honey. You can't get to heaven like that. And here's the problem. We start doing all of these things and we start rejoicing in ourself. Man, I've got $800 saved now. Man, I got $2,000 saved now. Can you believe it? I got $30,000 saved now. Man, can you, can you believe it? I ain't drinking all this time. I ain't done this and all. And we start letting our pride swell up. And we feel good about ourselves. The problem is... We're not to rejoice in ourselves. We rejoice in the Lord. Can you go back to that scripture for me and leave it on? Thank you. We are to rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord. You don't rejoice in yourself. You rejoice in the Lord. It's not about you. It's all about him. And and I know it seems monotonous. I know it seems tedious. I know I keep saying that over and over again. But the human desire is to promote self. And God is saying we're not to promote self. We're to promote him. So over and over again you hear the apostle Paul say rejoice in the Lord. Don't rejoice in yourself. Because the flesh wants to promote the flesh. But we are to promote God. Isaiah 42 and 8, it says, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another. I won't give my glory to another. Rejoice in the Lord. Every time we rejoice in AA and NA and our sobriety and how long we've been doing it and how good we are and how much money we saved and where we invested and how we did it and how many hours we work and how good we are and how much we volunteer and we talk about all the things that we have done, we take away from the glory of God and we give glory to ourselves. And the Bible says that God will not allow anyone to get glory except him. God forbid his children are giving glory to the wrong person. Can you go back to that other scripture for me again? Philippians chapter 3 and 1, finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord. We get that right? Don't rejoice in me. Don't rejoice in myself. Don't rejoice in yourself. Rejoice in the Lord. Then it says, for me to write the same things to you, it's not tedious. You need to hear it over and over again because our flesh always wants to rejoice in self. And then he goes on to say, but you, but for you it is safe. I began to think about that. For you it is safe. So so here's what it's saying. Brothers and sisters. When you rejoice in the Lord, you are safe. Brothers and sisters, when you rejoice in the Lord, it is safe. Let's change that around. When you rejoice in yourself, you aren't safe. You, when you rejoice in, the Lord, in yourself, it is not safe. How many of y'all have rejoiced in your sobriety and then you fell again? Nobody wants to be honest about it. Thank you for two people being honest. Everybody else is liars. How many of y'all have rejoiced in your ability to tame your tongue? You don't cuss no more, and then you cuss somebody out again. Come on, any more hands in here? Thank you. Let's shame the devil. Just shame him. Just shame him. We're going to shame him today. How many of y'all said, you know what, I'm going to do it right this time. And, and, and you started doing it right. You talking to people, man, I'm doing good now, bro. I got it all together. And then the next night, the same night. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? Look, it is not safe for you and it is not safe for me to rejoice in what we can do and what we have done because we always let ourselves down. The only one who is safe for us to rejoice in is the one who can keep his character every single day of the week. And only God is faithful and only God is sure and only God is true. Let every man be a liar. You want to rejoice in yourself? You rejoice all you want, but you better take heed lest you fall because everyone who starts bragging on their flesh ends up falling to the very thing they were bragging about. All of us, we are human, we are frail, we are jacked up, and we desperately need God. And I will not brag about how God has done, or about how I have gotten here and what I have done. I will say, man, I'm just going to tell you what God has done in my life. It's all him. I can't really understand it. Yes, I've worked hard. Yes, I've done this. But there's a lot of other people who work hard. I've made right decisions. There's a lot of other people who make right decisions. I've failed miserably. I've been lazy. I've messed up. But God has been so good. Look, it is so safe when I brag on God. See, when I make it about God, it's safe. But when I make it about me, it's hazardous. When you rejoice in the Lord, oh my, it's safe. But when you rejoice in yourself, it's very unsafe. We can't control anything. I remember telling someone the other day, and I keep saying the same thing. I say, you know what? Being health conscious is so important to me. You know, I remember being uh, in my late 20s, and I was about 40 or 50 pounds above what I am now. And, uh, And I said, it's time for me to get a hold of this as I'm 30, because if I don't, it's gonna get a hold of me. And I started getting more serious. And the older I get, the more serious I get. And now y'all would call me bougie. I'm not bougie. Well, maybe I am bougie. But but it's not just bougie. I just, I like good food. and, And I'm trying to be conscious of my choices. But here's the thing. I can eat all the things right. I can run 20, 30 miles a week. I can go to gym multiple days a week. I can take my vitamins and eat all the best things in the world. But I will never brag on my health and how healthy I am and all that I've done because some of the most healthy people get diagnosed with some of the worst things. I have no control over what happens tomorrow. I am not going to sit here and be thankful because of, oh, how good I got it. Oh, how this I got. And you know what? I've done this because you know what? Really? I can't control anything. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 and 36, you shall not swear by your head because you cannot make one hair black or white. It don't matter if you're black or wrong. Oh, wrong thing. That's what just came to my head. That wasn't in my notes. It, I'm telling you, I, it's so weird that like I, the weirdest things come to me at the worst times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then I thought Michael Jackson and I wanted to like just act it out. But acting out Michael Jackson's a little bit creepy. Might go to jail. So, you know, I just kind of, you went too far, Ray. You really did. Um, you, should, you should not swear by your head. Why? Why? And let me give you a little context here. Um, Jesus was talking to, to his uh, disciples, and he says, you know what? He says, you know, some of y'all like to make oaths, and, and you want to make promises. And, you know, I, 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 man, like today, like what he'd say today is, why are you going to swear on your dead granny's uh, soul? I put that on my granny's soul, bruh. I didn't care about you putting that on your granny's soul, bruh. That's creepy anyway. About to kill your granny because you're lying. Right? And you hear people like putting, oh, no, I put that on. Hey, I put that on my mama. Oh, yeah, I bet you would put that on your mama. What Jesus is saying is don't, don't be swearing on your dead granny's soul. Don't be swearing on your mama. Don't make no oath. Don't make an oath. It, it says, he, says, you can't, he says you can't swear. He says not only can you not make an oath and swear on someone else, you can't even swear by your own head. 
He says, you know why? He says, you can't control when you're going to gray out and when you won't. Like, I know I need to go get a haircut right now because this morning I was looking in the mirror and I'm like, dang, I'm getting gray. Miguel, I'm calling you this week, brother. Get, I got to get a, get a haircut, cover this gray up a little bit because I'm not getting it get colored or anything. But, you know, I can't control this. I've been speaking these grays to go black again, but they won't. They won't turn. You want to know why? We can't control it. We can't control cancer. We can't, con we can't control hairs turning gray. We can't control when we're going to rip a ligament, when we're going to tear an ACL. We can't control it. We can't control it. It says, but let, it says, rather than swearing and all this, because you can't, you can't do anything about it, let your yes be yes and your no be no, and anything more than that is of the evil one. The point that I want to make here is, is that, that, that we are unsafe rejoicing in our flesh or our own abilities. You cannot rejoice, you cannot find comfort, you cannot be confident in what you bring to the table because you can't control it. You could lose your job tomorrow. Oh, no, not me. I work for the federal government. No, don't be too cocky. Look, the federal government it, it could soon just slip away. We are trillions of dollars in debt, and at any moment, our whole country could collapse. Oh, no, that won't happen. because No, no, look, we got to understand something. Nothing's promised. Nothing, nothing is promised. And we are rejoicing in systems and corporations and our talent and our gifts and our health and the way we eat and what we bring to the table. And God is saying, it is not safe for you to rejoice in that. The only thing you can rejoice in is me. I'm stable. I'm the only thing that surely will be here the same way tomorrow. I was the same yesterday, I'm the same today, and I'll be the same forevermore. I'm the alpha, the beginning, and the omega, the end. I am everything. I'm the great I am. There's nothing outside of me. And, and you, are, you, 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 you are bragging on you, and you find confidence in you. You find confidence in systems, in talent, in education, in your money, and all of these things aren't safe. The only thing that's safe is me. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. I know it may seem tedious, but it's not tedious. I need to remind you constantly, rejoice in the Lord. The second point is this. Beware of mutilation. Beware of mutilation. Mutilation. Again, think about that. He's saying that we need to beware of mutilation. I said, man, let, let me just look. I know what that word means, but, but, but I, want, I, want to just, I want to see what the dictionary says. And it says disfigurement, dismembering, damage, vandalization. It's the action of mutilating or being mutilated. The point is, is the Apostle Paul is saying, be careful of those who try to mutilate the gospel. They try to damage or dismember or disfigure or vandalize or change it from its original message. Be careful. Beware because they are dogs, Philippians chapter 3 and 2. It says, beware of these dogs, Philippians chapter 3 and 2. I sense it coming. Beware of these dogs. Beware of these evil workers. Beware of their mutilation. Beware because they are coming with an assignment to change the gospel. Well, well, what is the premise of his message here? The premise of his message is that we can't do anything in ourselves to get closer to God that God does it all. We can't do anything. And, and, and I believe what the Apostle Paul is saying is we need to be careful 
Because there's going to be people who come along and they stand on a platform and they try to tell you that there's things that you can do to make God aware of you. There's things that you can do to win favor with God. There's amount of times you can pray. There's food you eat. There's food you abstain from. There's laws that you keep. There, there's religious practices that you perform. There's ceremonies. There's rituals. And if you do these types of things, you're right with God. And, and he says, look, I'm just going to tell you, the Bible is thousands of years old. And, and there's going to be people who come along with new doctrine Years later, and they're going to try to tell you that there's new ways to get to God, and I'm telling you there's only one way to get to God. There's no other way, and you need to be careful because people are going to develop their own ideologies and their own ideas, and they are mutilated. They are dismembered. They're disfigured. It is not the complete gospel. It's not the whole gospel. There's only one way for you to be right with God, and it's the blood, and it's always been the blood. Be careful. Be careful. That's what he's saying. He says, you need to be careful of dogs. Be careful. Be careful. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the gospel message changing. You know, I could go into a whole theological lesson, and I can't right now, but I always like to look back in the um, Old Testament when we look at Abraham and, and, and Adam and, and many other of the figures that, that is in the Bible and also in the Quran and is in the Holy Torah and in, is in the World Living Translation and, and various types of, of books. And, and they all have this Old Testament that's the same. And, and what we see is that Adam sinned. And when he sinned, he was exposed. And and then he needed something in order to keep living. You know what he got? A blood sacrifice. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. God killed an animal and covered him in animal skin. And then Abraham made sacrifices unto God. Abel made sacrifices, and they were acceptable to God, but Cain's was not. We'll talk about that in a moment. You see that David and many other people in the Bible, they were all made right with God through a sacrifice. How many of y'all know that God doesn't change? If God doesn't change and he was the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he needed a sacrifice then, guess what he needs now? A sacrifice. The problem is, is we can't make a sacrifice on our own because we're sinful beings. It has to be something without sin in order to die for something that has sin. So there's a sacrifice that still needs to be made, and people will tell you, you don't need a sacrifice anymore. God has made a new way. God has not changed. The same Bible that was written four, five, six thousand years ago, the same scriptures that were preserved, the same Bible then that became the gospel, the New Testament two thousand years ago, is still the same today. And anyone who tries to say there's a new way, a hybrid way, a, 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 a coming together of multiple faiths way to get to God, I want to say I, I'm not sure about that. Because the Apostle Paul was warning the church to be careful of mutilation. To be careful of people who will come along and dismember the original text. Look what it says in Galatians. Galatians is the same thing. One of my favorite books of the Bible is Galatians. And, Gal and Paul is writing to the church of Galatia and, and he's saying, hey, he says, what's happened to you? He says, I, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from Jesus who called you in the grace of God. He says, I marvel. I'm shocked. I don't get it. He says, I came. I ministered to you. You got saved. You got spirit filled. You were on fire. The church was growing. I leave. And now I'm hearing that Judaizers came in. And they're preaching a gospel that's not true. And I'm marveling. I'm shocked that you have so quickly turned away from the very thing that Jesus has called you to, which is the grace of Christ. He says the whole gospel message is the grace of Christ. And they're calling you away to a different gospel. But there is no other gospel. 
But there are some of you, um, some who trouble you, and they want to pervert the gospel of Christ. They're, they're trying to change it. It says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preached any other gospel to you than what we have already preached to you, let them be accursed. What he's saying is, look, the gospel's been preached, the Bible's been written. If we come preaching something different or someone else preaches something different, don't you believe it? Because the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit and it is done. And any new gospel that comes is not the gospel. It's mutilation. He says, God has made the message very clear. We are all sinners, and we need a Savior, and the only way to get to God is through Christ Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, It's all through the Bible, and now they start teaching it. They're teaching about Adam needing a sacrifice. And just as sin came through one man, salvation came through one man. It talked about uh, Abraham and, and all the other blood sacrifices that were made and now how Jesus became the, uh, the last sacrifice for all men and how bulls and goats and lambs would cover sin and forgive their sin but Jesus not only forgave their sin but because he's perfect he took away their sin and gave them the righteousness of themselves, of himself. And he says, you need new, no other gospel now. He says, there's good news, Gentiles. You don't need to become a Jew to get saved. There's good news, prostitute. God loves you right where you are, even though you were sleeping around. There's good news, drug addict and alcoholic. There's good news to you who are struggling with your identity. You don't know who you are. Christ loves you and you are redeemed right where you are. The good news, the gospel message is simple. We don't deserve it. We can't work our way to it. God loves us right where you are. And beware of preachers. Beware of prophets. Beware of religions who come along and preach good works to you and tell you you need to pray, you need to eat, you need to do this, you need to say that, you need to act like this to get to heaven because none of that gets you to heaven. Only the work of Jesus does. That's what he's saying. So, so, it, goes, so it goes on. Heaven comes, heaven comes through Christ, not through men's good work. We can't work our way to heaven. Why? Why can't I work my way to heaven? Is God holy? Yes or no? Is God holy? Yes. God is holy. Do you think that God is going to allow unholy, unrighteous, sinful people into a heaven that is perfect and without sin? No. If we sin in 1988 and you have not accepted Jesus today, do you still think, even though you're living right, that sin's still there? Yes. You are a recovered sinner, but still a sinner. You, it doesn't matter what you do. I, I remember one time a lady told me, hey, 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 once you're an addict, you're always an addict. I believe that until I meet Jesus. I, I believe once I'm a sinner, I'm always a sinner. Once I'm a drug addict, an alcoholic, I'm always that. But once I meet Jesus, everything has the ability to change. And I say that to you because, look, you may be, you know, say you're 12, 13, 14, 15, making bad decisions, doing things you shouldn't do. Then you get 20 and, oh, now you're 21, going out partying, drinking, now 25, going, you know, here, there, and everywhere. And you're doing your thing finally at 35 or 32 or 45. You have a kid, you have three kids, somebody dies in your family, you have a wake-up call, now you're ready to change your life. Stop drinking, stop smoking, doing all the right things now. You're a great person. Everyone loves you. Everyone believes in you. Here's the problem. You can live from 40 to 100. That's 60 years doing good. But if you did the first 40 doing bad, you're still a sinner. And God cannot have a sinful being in his presence in heaven. The only way that we will stand face to face with God is if we have been cleansed from our sin and no one can be cleansed unless there's a sacrifice that forgives us for our sin. And what separates us from many other people is we know that our connection to God isn't based off what we do, it's based off what he did. He did it all. We don't have to do anything. 
Okay, so, so that's the gospel message. So, so this is why Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God, but Cain's wasn't. See, Cain's was a work-based sacrifice. He took the things that he had, what he worked with, he, and, and, and he gave them to God, and God didn't accept it. And people say, well, man, that's messed up. Why didn't God accept it? All he had to do was change it. If you take God the wrong sacrifice and then he tells you to give the right sacrifice, all you got to do is give a new one. But Cain was angry that God didn't accept his works. <laughs> oh, oh I can't, you don't accept what I'm bringing? Oh, this ain't good enough for you, is it, God? You want me to do it different? God's like, really, it's not that hard. All I'm asking is for a blood sacrifice. Something has to die. The wages of sin is death. Something has to die because of your sin. So if something doesn't die, you will. But when we put our faith in the one who died for us, it says that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in him, though he may die, yet shall he live. See, we will never die now because he already died for us. But when you don't take the sacrifice and the faith in him dying for you, one day you will die. And when you die, you will not live forever with God because you have to die once. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, the only way to get to heaven is if we are born again. You're born once by the flesh and once by the spirit. The flesh will not get you to heaven. Only the Spirit will. And the Spirit comes alive through the work of Calvary's cross. Abraham was justified. How? Not by the law. Abraham was justified by faith. See, legalistic people don't like this because they think that if they work harder, they become more holy. But the truth is, is faith alone connects us to God. That's it. I mean, now, oh, does that mean all I got to do is have faith and I can live like I want? No, that's not what it means. But what it means is you can't even start on your journey with God unless it's by faith. You can't start on your journey with God doesn't start because you stop drinking or because you start praying five times a day. Your journey with God is simply saying, God, you know what? I desperately need you. I'm broken. I'm lost. I don't deserve anything. And I'm asking you to just change me. I deserve to die, but what I'm hearing is Jesus died for me. So, Lord, I pray. I know I deserve to die. You know what? I'm not going to talk about anybody else. I'm going to talk about myself. I'm going to talk about what I've done. I don't deserve to be in heaven with you. I don't deserve to live on the streets of gold and have a mansion. I don't deserve to be in a place forever where no vaccinations are needed. There's no sicknesses, no medications, no fighting, no bullying, no drug addiction, no alcoholism. I don't deserve a place like that because my family's messed up. I'm messed up. But Lord, what I'm hearing is that I can go there. All I need to do is die. So I'm praying that I die today. Jesus, thank you for dying for me, and I want to live for you. Abraham was justified not because he kept the law. Abraham was justified because he had faith. We are not justified. We are not saved. We are not reconciled to God the Father because we start doing a bunch of right things. We're reconciled to the Father because Jesus died so we don't have to. Simply put, the real gospel is the good news that we can be right with God through faith and it requires nothing from us. Nothing from us. Ephesians 2 and 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not by works. It's nothing you've done yourself. It's a free gift of God. Lest anyone should boast boast in their flesh, rejoice in their flesh. God's saying, I'm not going to let any of y'all rejoice in your flesh and talk about you got to heaven because you got a good job. You got to heaven because you started doing everything right. You got to heaven because you prayed the right way, the right time, the amount of times a day. No, 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 I'm not going to let you get to heaven because of what you did, how you looked, and what you wore. Food don't keep you from heaven. Food don't get you to heaven. 
the work of Jesus does. So the point that I want us to close with, which is a long one, so don't get happy, is we put no confidence in our flesh. We can put no confidence in our flesh, guys. Again, we rejoice in the Lord. Number two, we beware of mutilation. But number three, we put no confidence in our flesh. No confidence in our flesh. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence, I have it even more. What the Apostle Paul is saying is if any of y'all here, if anyone else thinks that they have confidence in their flesh, let me tell you what, I've got a whole lot more reasons to have confidence in my flesh. Well, let, let, me, let me make this simple. Some of you today maybe have never drank. You never got high. You, 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 can, you can't remember lying. You, you only remember living good, doing good, making good decisions. Or maybe you say, there's no way that I won't go to heaven just because I X, Y, and Z. Yeah, you know, and, and we, we separate sin and levels of sin. We got, we got molesters and we are pedophiles and we got sexual folks and then we, then we got drug addicts and alcoholics and we, we separate. And we, oh, they can probably get in. They can probably get in. Ah, they're probably not going to. You know, I'm definitely going to go because I've never done all those things. Mine's been really simple and, and little. You know, I mean, if I got a problem, it's I work too much. And what happens is we become confident in our flesh. And we think that maybe we can get to heaven because of what we've done or what we haven't done. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, any of you who thinks that your flesh has been good enough to get you to heaven, you better reconsider. Because if there's anyone who thought they were going to heaven, he says, it was me. I knew I was going to heaven. Paul is saying he, he, he had so much to boast about. He says, I've got more to boast about than any other Jew. Any other Jew. I've surely got more to boast about than all of you Gentiles. He says, man, he, Paul says, Paul, Paul then gives this detailed description or reasoning. He wants us to know why he was boasting in himself. And he breaks it down for us. He gives us a list of his achievements. He speaks of how great he is. He speaks of how great he was. Or better yet, he gives us a list of how great he thought he was. And he begins to break it down. And here's what he says, right? He says, he says first off, he speaks to his birth privilege. He says, I'm a native Israelite. I'm of the stock of Israel. And he was of the tribe of Benjamin. So, so you, maybe this doesn't mean anything. He said, but I want you to understand what this means. When, when he's talking about this, he's saying, I'm of the tribe in which the, in which the temple stood. The temple was in Benjamin. And he says, and not only did the temple stand in Benjamin, he says, Benjamin is the only tribe that stood with Judah. He says, if anybody's got bragging rights, it's me. He says, all these other tribes of Israel, they didn't stand with Judah, but I did. All those, other, all those other tribes, they didn't have the temple there, but I did. He says, you want to talk about, about, about being a Hebrew? He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. What he was saying is, I'm an Israelite on both sides. He was saying, my father and my mother are Hebrew. He's saying, my grandfather and grandmother are Hebrew. What he was saying is, generation after generation, every one of my ancestors are Hebrews. I have never been anything less than 100% Hebrew. He says, we're God's chosen people. He says, you want to talk about somebody who became arrogant. I became arrogant. I knew I was God's chosen people. I never mixed married like the Samaritans did. I never walked out of my faith like they did. He says, I've always been a good, outstanding, upright Hebrew. He goes on to say, he says, I could boast about my relationships with the church, my covenant, he says, I, he says, God, hey, look, I made a covenant with God. When, when, I, when I was just a kid, my, my parents circumcised me on the eighth day. You might say, well, what does that mean? See, this, this shows us how much of a Hebrew he really was that, that, get, that it, it was a token of God's covenant. 
by, by the circumcision. And God instructed them to do it on the eighth day. Not the seventh day, not the ninth day. They were to be circumcised on the eighth day. This was God's appointed time. And he says, you know what? I was circumcised on the eighth day. The weather was good. There, there wasn't some sort of, uh, of, of, of holiday or high holiday. There was nothing that kept me away. Not only am I a Hebrew, a Hebrew, a Benjamin of the tribe of Benjamin, not only, not only am I like 18th generation Hebrew, but I was actually circumcised on the eighth day, just like God instructed. He says, man, you want to talk about someone who was arrogant? It was me. He says, you want to talk about, let me, get, let me tell you about my education. For learning, I was a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee. I brought, if you read in Acts chapter 22 and 23, it talks about how Paul came up and he studied under a guy, Gamaliel. And, and this, this guy was, was, was one of the most well-known Pharisees who taught Paul. And Paul was talking about if he had the right to be arrogant, oh, this is a good reason right here. He says, I was a doctor of the law. He had his doctorate in the law of Moses. He kept the law. He said that he was a scholar. He was a learned man that knew the word of God. He knew the things of God. He was taught according to the perfect manner of the law of his fathers. And he kept it. Not only was he a Pharisee, according to the book of Acts, his parents were Pharisees. He was a generational Pharisee. If anybody had anything to be arrogant about, it was the Apostle Paul. He trusted in his flesh to get him to heaven. I want to warn you, your good works alone can't get you to heaven. Then he goes on and he says, it says that he could be considered blameless by the law. He had been an active man for his religion. He was zealous. He was so zealous that he persecuted the church because he thought the church was coming against God. Paul just lays it out. He lets us know clearly that if anybody had, to be, had the right to be arrogant in their flesh, it was him. If anyone could get to heaven without Jesus... It was him. But then he was on the road to Damascus. And he encountered blindness. He encountered Jesus. He encountered redemption. He realized all his life he was told he was good because of everything he's done. But he realized in a moment's notice that he was sinful. And that his sin was going to keep him from God. He realized he needed a savior. He realized that something needed to die for him. He realized that that sacrifice was Jesus. Paul was a very successful man. He had so many achievements. Not to mention he came from a great family. And though he had a lot to brag about, though his flesh was pretty good, he considered his righteousness, as the Bible calls it, rubbish. He says in Philippians 3, 8, I have suffered the loss of things, and I count them as rubbish. Rubbish, in another translation, the NIV says garbage. The King James Version is my favorite, dung. I count it as dung. I count it as a pile of poop, manure, some old stanky stanky. I emoji it with the poop emoji. Ain't nothing. That's some stink. And he says, you know what? I suffered a loss. I lost a lot of things. What did he lose? His livelihood, his vocation, his career, his family, his network, his job. Gone. He was a Pharisee. He, paid, he got paid. That's what he did for a living. And, and when he walked away from it and followed Jesus, he was ostracized. The very people that killed Jesus was one of him. And he left them. And had to become a tent maker. 
He went from being notable, uh, uh, creditable and, and, and having notoriety and, and being known and being one of the most popular, well-known on his way to the top of the top among the Pharisees to being kicked out of the fold. And that's what he's saying. He says, I've suffered a great loss. I realized that my tribe, my whole life I was told how special I was because I'm a Benjamin. A Benjamite? That ain't nothing. My whole life I was told how, how good I was because I'm an Israelite? I'm nothing. My whole life I was told that, that I'm better than other people because I've kept the law and I know the law? I am nothing. All my life I was told if I make right decisions, I keep studying, I try hard, that I'll be close to God, and I finally figure it out after 40 years of my life, I am nothing. He finally got it. He finally realized that his works, his flesh, did nothing when it comes to connecting with God in the Spirit. You can't connect to a spiritual God with your fleshly works. Just as Paul had to give up all he knew. He had to give up all that he knew. He had to give up all that he had gained. He had to give up all that he had learned. We need to be willing to give up all we know. What is it that you've been taught all your life and maybe today you're saying, you know what? Maybe there's some things I need to give up. Maybe I need to revisit my cultural traditions. Maybe I need to give up some of my family importances importance, the things that I love so much. Maybe, maybe, maybe I need to reevaluate my walk with God. Maybe I've put too much pride and joy and focus on my flesh. Maybe we need to give up who we are. Maybe we need to relook at who we are. Maybe we need to consider forsaking and inviting God into our lives. I said this before and I'll say it again. You're not a black man to my black brothers. You're not a white man to my white brothers. You're not a white woman, a black woman. You're not an Asian, Indian, Middle Eastern, Hispanic, African. You, that's not who you are. You, you are not where you were brought up. You are not where you were born. You, you are not what your education is. You're more than a factory worker. You're more than a medical worker. You're more than a teacher. Those labels aren't who you are. That's not who you are. See, and some of us need to be reprogrammed because our whole life we were taught that's who we are and we find pride and joy in that. And, and I want you to tell you that it is not about who we've been told we are. It's not about us anymore. It's not about our family tree anymore. It's not about our cultures anymore, our traditions anymore, our religion anymore. That's not what it's about. It's not about our own identity. It's not about who we are and what we want to do. It's about God. It's easy and it's a great benefit to our personal life when we give up certain areas such as drinking, drugs, smoking, like well, it's easy. Like we give up those things and, and it's a benefit for us, right? We give up drinking, who benefits from it? Me and my liver, right? We give up, we give up um, drugs and who benefits from it? Well, your boss does because you'll show up on time, right? Your kids do because now you can pay for their things and not your habit. But your body does, your heart does. Okay, so we benefit. We benefit from drugs and alcohol and, and changing those types of things in our lives. And, and quite frankly, that's the easy stuff to give up. But what about if God is asking you to give up your identity? What if you find out that you're more than just a Hispanic man? A Middle Eastern woman? A black girl? What if you find out that you're more than the title that you've given yourself? What, what if God is asking you to give up something that you hold dear to your heart? Can you? 
The Apostle Paul says, you know what, everything I gave up, I didn't give up things that were bad. I gave up things that were good. Because what I realized is that those things meant more to me than God did. I wonder how many times we hold on to things so dearly because we love them more than God. Luke chapter 9 and 23, it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, deny his traditions, his identity, the things that he loves, and let him take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, you want to save your identity? You want to save all this? You'll lose it. But whoever is willing to lose their life, for my sake, will save it. See, it may seem like you're losing a whole lot by giving up who you are, but you're really saving everything. For what profit does it have for a man if he gains the whole world, yet he himself is destroyed or lost? See, that's, that's why we, we got to really look here and, and say, what are we doing we say that we're drawing closer to God, but a lot of times it's like we think that this, the spiritual connection with God is to build our flesh. And we keep chasing what we want. And we think that if we keep doing the things that we want, these good things, it gets us closer to God. And God is saying, no, I am spirit. I'm spirit. In Philippians 2 and 5, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. It's saying, don't let your mind be a black man anymore, but the mind of Jesus. Don't let your mind be a hood dude anymore, but the mind of Jesus. Don't let your mind be a woman anymore, but the mind of Jesus. Don't let your mind be a, a person who has been traumatized and hurt and you're angry and you're on edge and you're anxious or you're always looking at people suspiciously. That's not your mind anymore. It's the mind of Jesus. And, and really, this is the same thing that it says in Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, our whole lives, we put so much pride and joy in who we are. And God says, it's not about who you are. It's not about who you are. You're telling me i got to give up my identity, my look, my culture? Maybe. It's not about you. It's about him, isn't it? How about 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 17? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. See, this is the thing that separates us, is, is that, that, that the Bible says that, that, that God came and as a gift in Jesus, and that he, he became our righteousness, and he took on our sin, that we may become his righteousness. So, so he, be, he became sin for us who knew no sin that we may become his righteousness. We become him and he takes on our sin. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, once you fall in love with God, once, once you ask him into your heart, once you say, Jesus, I need you to die for me like you died for him and her because I want to be changed. It says that you are changed. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And old things pass away and all things become new. When you're in Christ, you actually get a heart transplant. And he takes out, according to the book of Isaiah, he, he takes out, I think Isaiah, Isaiah, or I think it's Isaiah or Jeremiah, one of the two major prophets. He, he says he takes out the heart of flesh, of stone, and gives us a soft heart. See, Christ has the ability to be the surgeon that you've always needed and give you the heart that you never know, knew that you needed. When you say, God, I messed up, I need you desperately, he comes into your trauma. He comes into your pain. He comes into your discouragement, your brokenness. He comes into all of those things that you held so dear and he gives you a heart of flesh. He gives you his heart. That's why we celebrate communion, because he lived his entire life self 
selflessly and then died for us. And when we take on the faith in his death, we come to life and now we live our lives as he did. Pastor, why do you give so much? Because God gave me everything. That you're such a giver, I've not always been a giver. You love people, I've not always loved people. You're always willing, I've not always been willing. What's changed? I realized that I was messed up. And I just said, God, I need something different. And he says, I'm gonna give you something different. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and everything becomes new. So you may today be saying, Pastor, I, I get what you're saying, but you know what? I, I was born this way. I was told that this is who I am. It's not true. It doesn't matter how you were born. I'm not here to debate who was born with this and who was born with that. I'm just here to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. And he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. It's not about how you were born the first time. It's about are you being born again? Every person was born once by the flesh, and we were all born jacked up. Some were born with, uh, with tendencies that are different from other people, but we were all born in sin. And if you think that your sinful nature can get you to heaven, you've missed it. The way we get to heaven is our spirit coming alive. Our spirit will go with God. So in closing, I say this. All you got to do is say, God, I've been born once. But if I'm real honest, I was born messed up. There's a lot of things I love about me but there's some things that I hate about me. And I know those things that I don't like are the things that are going to keep me out. But I've gotten good news today. And the good news is, is though I've been born once messed up, I can be born again. And, and you know what? Maybe someone here is still doubting, and, and I'll just say to you, you can just, just, just offer up a, a prayer of doubt. Okay, and it's just, all, just bear with me a second. You're doubting. I'm not here to come against your doubting. I'm, asking, I'm encouraging you to offer up a prayer of doubt. And just say, God, I don't really know what's true. I'm trying to figure it out. I've been taught one thing. I'm seeing something different. I feel something different. I feel like you're talking to me, but I'm fighting against my traditions. I'm fighting against everything I was taught. And I just want to ask you to pray a prayer of doubt and just say, God, if this is true, I want you. Just say, Jesus, I just, if you really died for my sins and I can have a new heart, I want it. If you died for my sins that my flesh can be exposed and put in check and my spirit can come alive and I can have a relationship with you, I want it. I, I don't know that I completely believe it because of everything I taught, but if it's there, Lord, just, just, that's it. Look, if you got doubt in your mind and in your heart, there's no need to pray a fake, phony, confident prayer that's not confident. So just talk to the God, just talk to God with, with, with the apprehensiveness and, and the doubt that's in your head and heart and just say, if it's there, I want it. Look, look, God, God wants to change us. He wants to change you. And the way we're changed is not by attending meetings. It's by asking for forgiveness and welcoming what Jesus has already done for us. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for this message today. I pray that you will help people to understand 
who you are and the work that you have done for us. Lord, the Bible says that the gospel is like foolishness to those who have not been enlightened by your spirit. And the Bible also says that no one can come to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. So what I'm praying right now is that heaven will open. And that the Holy Spirit will come down and begin to speak to people all over this building. I pray that heaven will open over houses of people who are watching online right now. And that the Holy Spirit is ministering in this building just like he is in your living room, your dining room, your kitchen, your bedroom. Father, I pray the Holy Spirit is creating a yearning in some of y'all's hearts right now. A hunger for more. A hunger for something to change. I pray that God is uprooting things that have been in you so long and just having you just come back to the table with a clear mind and say, God, speak. I know that we're over on time, but please just bear with me just for a minute. God, please do what only you can do in the same way that I encountered you on February 22, 2001 and had a reality check, a wake-up call, an encounter with heaven, I pray that there are people in this building and people watching online that are having that same encounter. No more mundane, going through the motions, monotonous relationship with God that doesn't really feel real. There's no depth to it. I'm praying for something to change in some of y'all's hearts today. That there's going to be depth to your walk with God. That your heart is going to change. Father, there's nothing we can do on our own to gain our way or work our way to heaven. It's only by what you've done. And I thank you for the gospel. If there's anybody here, Lord, that you have ministered to in a special way and wants to receive Jesus or wants prayer or, or just, just wants us to agree with them, I pray, Lord, that you'll begin to put it on their hearts to join us, whether it's now or later at this altar, that we can help them. If there's anybody here that needs prayer, these altars are open for you and we would love to pray for you. Father, thank you so much for who you are, for being relentless, for being a pursuer, for loving us the way you do in spite of us being who we are. Help us, Lord. Help us to continue to draw closer. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you as you come. If there's anybody else here, these altars are open. We'd love to pray for you. God bless you. I surrender. Thank you. I surrender Let's just take a minute and worship together. Let's just take a minute as we close and worship together.
Thank you for joining us today. If you were touched by the message and you would like to receive prayer, we have a prayer team standing by waiting to pray with you. If you have a prayer need, or maybe you would like to know more about Jesus, please put your request in the comment section below and someone will connect with you. If you've been impacted by the ministry and would like to support us with your giving, you can do so by giving online or by texting the word INVEST to 22383. We'd like to take this time to invite you to join us right here in the building next week if you're able. We hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Have a blessed week.